So without further ado, let me first sketch a little bit what the day is going to be all about. In the morning, what I did is invite a number of our faculty to give sn small uh, kind of uh, nuggets of ideas uh, about swarms. And, uh, and I think you might not be familiar with swarms yet, but you will be for sure at the end of this morning. And then in the afternoon, we have the uh, official opening, the ribbon cutting of the center, uh, combined with uh, poster sessions, demos by students, and so on and so forth in the new facilities. So, so this is the overview of the day. We start with the Swarm Vision session this morning. Uh, lunch. John, sorry, put your mic not on. I'm not recording. Is it not on? Are we on now? Yeah. Good. Sorry for that. So uh, lunch is my, uh, at noon, um, 1 to 2 p.m., and then in the afternoon we have the posters and the official uh, um, uh, room cutting. But before going there, let me um, explain a little bit what we're all about. So um, I think uh, something very exciting is happening is in uh, synchronicity with the emergence of uh, the cloud, as we know, uh, the, the idea of having many, many, many computing devices connect together in large clusters, and also the mobile access layer that has been very attractive or become a very important player for us on how to access information. Over the last uh, 10 years or so, we have seen a third layer emerging, a layer of numerous sensing actuation devices distributed to the environment and wirelessly connected to the infrastructure formed by the cloud and the mobile access layer. Now, the exciting part of these things is if you start doing the math on it and you do the numbers, you might realize that uh, the numbers that are possible, the numbers that might emerge there are quite staggering. And the idea of having a thousand little wireless devices per person on Earth might not be extreme. Now, if you do the total, you the total picture, we suddenly start seeing trillions of distributed sensors connected together using wired or wireless networks. And once you start realizing that, you might see that it might fundamentally change the way we interact with information or the way we interact with each other. So this is what I call the swarm at the edge of the cloud. Now, you start basically getting your fantasy going. It says, if this is the case, what might be enabled? And a number of the scenarios have been explored extensively over uh, the last couple of years. Um, actually, this vision that I just painted is not, the only, it's not our own vision only. I just showed some other pictures from various companies. This is a picture that Paul Jacobs used recently uh, at an event that we had down in the South Bay, which is a transformation of the same type of perspective of the triple layer structure. The other slide is from a strategic uh, presentation offered by uh, Cisco. So the picture itself is appealing and quite attractive. Now, as I said, some of those opportunities are well known. Uh, we've talked a lot about cyber physical systems. The idea that what the sensory swarms are going to do is connect the cyber world, the world formed by those massive numbers of computing and processing devices, with the physical world. And things like smart grids, smart mobility, efficient homes, and so on and so forth, an example. A counterpart will be the other side, basically. That's something that's uh, very interesting as well, and that's not been often mentioned, uh, not as often been mentioned, is what I would call cyber biological systems. If we start wearing sensors on our body, we can basically enable or in our body and connect this again to the cyber world. Tremendous opportunities in healthcare, uh, augmentation, um, uh, neuroprosthetic devices, advanced type of uh, uh, sensors for humans or animals might be possible. So what the sensor nets really do, what is uh, swarms really do, is connect our cyber world with the physical and biological world. So those things have been uh, described at full and, and obviously quite uh, and are being realized as we speak. However, I think there's some more to be happening. Uh, once you made, make this platform, and that's really what it is, the platforms of sensors, connected devices, spread around the environment, available to broad community, the unpredictable might happen. We might see things that we cannot imagine today emerge. And that's really where we might see the big surprises, the big opportunities. How to interact with information in a world 
where enriched sensors and informations are omnipresent. And you can just dream, but here's an example of one of those dreams that we're trying to pursue within the uh, Swamp Center and something that was originally kind of driven by the Berkeley Water Service Center is this idea of an empath. The idea that if I have the capabilities of having user interaction devices everywhere around me, in the environment or on my body, why should I still carry a mobile? The mobile might totally disappear. That's what we call the empath. So this is one of the examples of things that might be enabled by the uh, presence of a swarm style uh, uh, environment. Yet, we have been talking about swarms for quite a while, or sensor nets for quite a while, since the mid-90s approximately. Now it turns out that if you look at the real adoption, it actually has been quite slow. Rather than having a $5 billion market today, the market is rather five, uh, 500 million market, factor 10 approximately in change. Now the question is, why is that? Well, obviously, there's a sequence of technology reasons. Uh, maybe you have liability, energy life, and all those type of things, battery life, all those kind of things play. But to me, that's not the only thing. The thing that really is becoming a hindrance is the fact that each of the different industries has actually pursued their own solution. If you talk to building, the building world, the energy world, the healthcare world, all of them have been building their own stovepipe fragmented solutions. And that's really what we have right now. We have no economy of scale. We have a broad range of very dedicated solutions for a variety of industries and, and, and applications. And there's no lack of, there's basically a total lack of virtualization as a result. If you really want to build something that is broader, something that's more engaging, we really have to cross those barriers. We have to break the barriers between those different industry stovepipes. So to me, if one asks, what is the killer app for the swarms? Like people ask, what is the killer app for 3G? It was not a particular application, but it was the platform itself. If you can offer an open platform that makes it possible to have these widely distributed resources. We have sensors, we have actuators or output devices, we have a variety of networks, we have storage, we have computing distributed to the environment. That's the platform that's available. If I now can make this available to a broad range of application developers, application developers in home security, emergency, energy efficient homes, health monitoring, empaths, and so on and so forth, if you can make this available in an open fashion so that application developers don't have to be aware of the intricacies of the hardware and actually can share the hardware over multiple applications, then finally you enable a broad community. So we call this the Swarm OS, the idea of this mediation layer. And it's not the first time that this has been done. It has worked for PCs, it has worked for the internet, it has worked for smartphones. Open the platform and suddenly you basically unleash the power of innovation and creativity. And this is what the Swarm Up is all about, unleashing that creativity. Now, um, an operating system is, in the broad sense, is nothing else than something that presents an abstracted vision of hardware uh, to the application, so that the application developer is independent, but also manages dynamically all the resources that are available. Now, Swarm OSs, we're not the only one to talking about. This is some article I just found in ZDNet about a month ago, which talks about an operating system for smart cities. That's exactly the same type of mindset of what we're talking about here today. It's not easy. There's quite a bit of challenges, and you will hear a lot about them. It's heterogeneous, distributed, it's sparse, uh, it's context-aware, it's dynamic, it changes all the time. Reliability is an issue, security is an issue. But these are great research topics for us to be working on. So, for instance, one example that I'm practically uh, 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 active in is the world of wireless. If you start thinking about the fact that now I have trillions of devices and I have to connect them in a wireless fashion, in a reliable, always on way, you have quite a challenge. But actually here is also where the opportunity lies. Suddenly you have to start thinking about, hey, we have lots of devices. And get away from components, think, get away from point-to-point -point links, think about the fact that how can I build reliable wireless links if I have always a number of devices around me? So exploit locality, density, and collaboration. And uh, there's quite a number of various approaches that pop up in your mind right away when you start doing this. Things like mesh networking, relay networking, peer-to-peer -peer networking, make it possible for us to build wireless network 
that are more reliable, I believe, than wired networks. So this is kind of one of the ideas that emerges when you start thinking about swarms. Now, as I said, it's a hard problem. So that's why we basically decided to create this swarm lab. Uh, the swarm lab at Berkeley has as a mission to create an open and universal platform to foster the creation and distribution of a broad range of innovative swarm applications. That's really what we're all about. It's an incubator. An incubator where people can come together and build and integrate and bring innovative new applications together. And it builds on all the parts of our Berkeley campus, the College of Engineering, but even beyond that. So uh, this is our vision, and you will see today we're going to have a set of presentations, each of them basically trying to address some part of this stack that basically will ena enable this open and universal platform as we envision it. Now, we were lucky in the sense that um, about a year ago, uh, an opportunity emerged with the movement of the Marco Lab to the Marvell Lab right here, that we had an amount of space becoming available in uh, the Corey Hall. And at the same time, um, we had a generous donation coming our way from Qualcomm that helped us to grab the space and turn it into something which is really a playground, a playground for swarms. It's an open space that enables students to sit together with industry folks. Uh, we have the lab space uh, available as well as things which you call immersion rooms. The capability of deploying your own technology and living in your own technology, because that's the only way to really make it happen. And that's really what's going to happen today. We're going to see this uh, inauguration of this new lab. And while it's still a set of blank walls today, I think in the years to come, you will see some very exciting things emerging there. So I'm going to quit right here and just say we have a whole bunch of visions here. This morning, as I said, is going to be a bunch of snapshots of short visions, basically from various folks within the college and the department talking about what they see as part of the swarm vision. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's uh, move on to the first presentation. Um, and uh, I would like to invite our Dean Shankar Sassi to say a word of welcome, but also talk about his interest in swarms. Right. Uh, you know, Jan asked me to speak as, a, as a, uh, one of the faculty who will be doing research in the lab, and I'm certainly going to do that. But uh, before I do that, I'd just like to tell you, uh, just add to what Jan said at the end of his talk, you know, uh, this really is a happy day. It's the confluence of a lot of different research interests, the Berkeley Wireless Research Center, the Berkeley Sensor and Actuator Sense Center, Chess, the AMP Lab, music, you know, he had all these acronyms. You know, each one of those centers, uh, trust is cybersecurity, and uh, AMP Lab is algorithms, machines, and people, Par Lab for the parallel processing lab. You know, each one of these has been a major effort for us here in the sense of uh, being a project with a substantial number of faculty and students and sort of a five year. In some cases, a lot longer. BSAC is 25-year engagement in, uh, in in sort of research. But what I think the genius of Swarm, the Swarm Lab, is to pull all these constituents together to really think about uh, some of the most pressing problems about building the new information infrastructure for our lives. Uh, you know, you, I'm sure you've heard this, but I just, I just want to repeat it. You know, we have 7 billion people. There's 5.2 billion cell phones. There's going to be a billion cell phones. You know, some of them will be repeated. More than a billion cell phones sold in this next year. And, you know, Jan in the early days really challenged us with this vision by talking about this thousand radios per person. You know, a thousand times billion is really trillions. And, uh, you know, it puts in sharp focus really the technical challenges involved in what you can do with this level of uh, radios and, uh, and the infrastructure, the, the cyber-physical infrastructure, the cyber-biological infrastructure that Jan talked about, and swarms. 
Uh, I, I, also, I would be completely remiss in missing the huge influence that Citrus has had, with the building that we are in, in influencing this vision, because the vision has been, it's not just the tech push, but also it is integrating it into the fabric of our lives. Uh, the engineering advisory board you know, played a huge role. I distinctly remember one of the earliest pitches that uh, Arun gave, uh, that uh, Jan and uh, a group of people, uh, Eric Brewer and others, gave to Arun Serene, who had uh, just returned from his stint as CEO of Vodafone. And he came back and challenged everybody and said, you know, the only thing that's, on your, that's in your wallet, that's on your cell phone, is money. And what are you going to be doing in order to be able to bring financial services onto wireless? And, uh, you know, a very rich partnership ensued from that with a project of Nandan Nilekani, the former CEO of Infosys, who is a minister in India who wants to put national ID cards as SIM cards on phones. And the idea is that there are billions of people who don't have access to financial services today, don't have access to checking accounts, but who do have cell phones. And so you could actually enable them to participate in a banking system through this measure. And so, you know, the advisory board, especially Arun Serene and Paul Jacobs, but also the Sutarja brothers, uh, Dado Banatau, and indeed, you know, the, uh, the engineering advisory board sort of really worked with the principles of the center that Jan is going to introduce during the day to help pull this vision together, not to mention Qualcomm. And uh, I think, uh, you know, we'll have, uh, uh, as Jan said, you know, you'll have two sets. of there'll be, post there'll be posters in the afternoon and then also posters at the opening. Uh, Paul is bringing, uh, Paul Jacobs is bringing uh, really a substantive part of his board, his corporate Qualcomm board. And as far as I can tell, just about 90% of the senior officers of uh, Qualcomm to the ribbon cutting. I know there are a lot of you in this room that are friends of Irvin, Irvin Jacobs, and uh, many other senior people from the Qualcomm board, Matt Grobe, the CTO, and so on and so forth. So I think it'll be a very memorable afternoon in terms of the inaugural of the space. So what I want to do in my remaining seven minutes, uh, or less, is, uh, you know, Jan, I think, has a great idea about uh, limiting us to... Uh, these uh, seven minutes. So I just want to talk about security and privacy. You know, and I want to say this up front because in some ways the societal agenda is really about uh, bringing issue, all these illities, you know, usability, trust, trustworthiness. Uh, we call that high confidence, and I'll tell you what high confidence means in a second. Uh, privacy into the design of these swarms in this playground that Jan described on the fourth floor. And the idea behind the playground is to really live the technology and to live earlier prototypes of this. So the way I see it, you know, I think thanks to the efforts of uh, Chris, uh, Pister, uh, and, you know, David Culler, Jan, uh, Rujna, a lot of people in this room, you know, I think the sense of web agenda and the smart dust agenda is well on its way. You know, we can squabble as uh, Jan <laughs> sort of made, made us go about whether this has had the kind of market penetration we would have liked it to have and so on and so forth. But, I mean, quite simply, we really have been successful at uh, in instrumenting the world. You know, we it's good for understanding phenomena. These are all applications that have been done here, smart, uh, smart alarms, building comfort, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. That is, uh, this is uh, Dick White's sensors for turning radios based on uh, turning uh, lights on and off. This is inventory control, detecting changes in the environment. And finally, you know, sort of in terms of the taxonomy of applications, I think we are now beginning to close the loop around them. You know, so uh, certainly in the, in the European Union under the seventh framework, there's a lot of talk about this Internet of Things. Of course, you know, swarms goes a lot further than the Internet of Things. And so important, and I think Jan made these points in his first talk. You know, it's not just sensing. It's really integrating that with the cloud on the one hand and secondly, making decisions based on what you get from the swarm. And so according to me, you're really upping the ante in terms of the kinds of applications and services. And right at the, in one of Jan's slides, you know, he had this instrumented human being with uh, wireless sensors controlling arms and limbs. And, you know, that is really 
in terms of pushing the envelope in terms of, uh, I didn't dare put those applications at the bottom of that slide, but that's really sort of putting a stake in the ground in terms of how we are going. Uh, I want to start with some uh, slides that I actually Chris uh, uh, Pista shared with me a couple of years ago. And this is about industrial. So how it's going to transform a lot of different sectors. Let's just talk about industrial automation. So this, uh, you know, this thing's a very old acronym called SCADA, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. A $60 billion, very fractionated market. There are a few big players. Uh, but, you know, the, the kind of stuff that one associates with SCADA is, you know, what you see as you walk into these buildings, actually alarms going off and they shouldn't be going off and elevators that stop between floors, you know, all that's, that's sort of what one associates with SCADA or with, uh, you know, with refineries spewing uh, smoke and so on and so forth. So. We believe that this is an example. So these are actually Chris's slides that he got furnished by way of Emerson, which is that you know going from the wired SCADA infrastructure to a wireless infrastructure of the sort of a swarm of sensors really results in is the, the, the things driving it are the cost reduction for the maintenance uh, for the installation. That's the seven to ten fold reduction. This is from the from Emerson, which is one of the leading SCADA makers, telling you about why the what's driving these wireless sensors. You know, these are the wireless sensors that they want to put on top of these, uh, what they call field devices for measuring temperature, pressure, flow, and so on and so forth. So seven to ten-fold reduction from $9,000 to about 1000 And the other thing that they say is that these wireless infrastructures, because of the ability to, sort of, uh, to route around obstacles, to route around failures and so forth, are in fact both more reliable and easier to use. So this is really some of the drivers, and this is we're seeing this in spade for spades for buildings, you know, energy consumption in buildings. You know, people think about energy consumption. Forty percent of the energy that we consume in the United States is in buildings, and uh, you know, fifty-five percent is industrial buildings. Forty-five percent is commercial, and we believe that by instrumenting them with these swarms, you can actually reduce. Uh, Costa Spanos is going to embark on a project with others to try to reduce this by at least 50%, even though there's some people who think that the building energy consumption can be reduced by as much as 75%. You know, that's a, those are big gains in terms of energy efficiency technologies for addressing. And, and, you know, and swarms is the platform. And Jan is so right. You, know, you, you really have to work on the platform because each one of these applications is such a big, do, big domain. It's, it's really... Uh, it, it, you know, it has big payoffs on the other side of it. Here I'm talking about all of process automation. Uh, and, and, and by the way, for process automation, so 40% was in buildings, 35% is in industrial automation. If you could instrument these plants, you could reduce the energy consumption on these industrial plants as well. That's what's in it for this SCADA. Okay, and the piece that I'm specifically interested in, I'll spend three minutes talking about, are the vulnerabilities and the privacies. So the vulnerabilities are already there. And uh, I put together, a little, so if we start putting these swarms in our physical infrastructure, that's what Jan called cyber physical, you know, they're out there controlling things like water, power, gas, and they're being attacked. They're, and these are a chronology, you know, uh, disgruntled employees of uh, irrigated a lawn in a hotel in uh, Australia using... Uh, Sewage, that's what the, the first attack of a, uh, of a SCADA system. The California ISO grid independent systems operator, uh, the distribution system was attacked in 2007. This is water distribution in the central California uh, system. It's uh, Tamakalusa is a specific area of the water distribution system. You know, and quite often these attacks begin for financial gain. You know, people trying to draw power without paying for it, but then the mafia gets involved, and organized crime gets involved. So you start off with cyber criminals, hacktivists, rogue hackers, they get together, you know, and sooner or later the, uh, the ante gets upped continually. And so the, the kinds of attackers and their motivations are morphing constantly. And these attacks are here today. Even more scary is uh, people are hacking the SCADA systems of the LA traffic, 2008, the Polish subway, 2009. And of course, you know, what's been in the press a lot was the Stuxnet for attacking the Siemens control systems uh, in certain nuclear power plants in 2009. 
So these are real issues. You know, so when we put together these swarms, they have to be high confidence. So this term high confidence means three things. One is more or less robust and correct by construction. And those are some of the challenges, the first bullet that I have there. And there are challenges. So these are the kinds of challenges that we have been re working at piecemeal in some of the centers that, are, uh, that we are building on top of. But really, we are upping the ante in terms of uh, having these thousands of radios in terms of dealing with mobility, uh, the unreliable communications, and building reliable applications on top of uh, sometimes intermittent connectivity. The second piece is fault tolerance. If you have so many of these units, thousands of these units, you have to expect a certain number of them to, be, to fail and to be able to reconfigure them and to strike this balance between being able to operate through, this, through these faults while, uh, you know, so strike a trade-off between the safety of these systems. You know, in all of these cyber-physical systems or the cyber-biological systems, you know, the word crash it's more than a metaphor, you know. It's uh, real people, real cars going through intersections and so on and so forth. So I, I think that these are new I areas that we have to accomplish. And the last area is about is sort of uh, security and resilience. I will not talk as much about privacy, but I have to say privacy is also a... Uh, am I over time? Is that... All right. Uh, so three, uh, just say three words about availability, you know, about security. There's three words that one has to deal with, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So confidentiality is uh, the idea of using encryption to keep uh, what you transmit on these devices uh, secret. Integrity is to make sure the data is not corrupted, and availability is uh, not having denial of service attacks so as to starve controllers of the data that they used. All right. <laughs> All right. In deference to... <laughs> All right. So this is the way you control and create synchronicity between many devices. Uh, very insistent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It is secure, reliable, and confidential. All right, uh, our next presentation is uh, actually our next three presentations are going to be actually about immersion. The, immerse, uh, the capabilities offered by those distributed sensor nets and swarms to create truly immersive type of experience. And next presentation is going to be on the NPAD by John Warshnick. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. So I think today Jan has uh, uh, taken on an impossible challenge, and it's, it's not about the swarm lab, it's about keeping uh, 15 faculty to talk just for 10 minutes each. Uh, so I'm going to say a lot of what, uh, of what Jan said already, a little bit. Uh, let me start with this. So we're interested in uh, human-centric uh, computing, and you've all seen these kind of charts, and in fact, uh, Shankar mentioned this too, that We'll see that the, this shows the uh, inflection point for uh, mobile devices passing where they pass notebooks and desktops in total sales, and this should happen sometime next year. Uh, so there's uh, you know, kind of this natural progression that we've been seeing over the years. And um, the, the big question is what's, what's going to be next after mobiles? So this is a question some of us have been thinking about. And, and there's kind of some inherent weaknesses in, in handhelds that we don't like. For, for the, the biggest thing probably is the limited interactivity with these devices, uh, these very weak user interfaces. Uh, the other is that largely the content lives on the device, so you kind of have to carry it with you. And they're big, and I don't like to carry these things around with me, certainly laptops or, or iPad-type devices. Uh, so, of course, the cloud helps, and uh, now we're seeing iCloud uh, from Apple and Google Docs and all that helps. Actually, if you like this idea of storing content in the, in the cloud, I think Ocean Store was a much better idea. I think Kubi is here, is going to be here today talking. Uh, so that's something you might look at. So uh, some of us who hang around at the BWRC were asking this question. In fact, we're kind of looking for long-range 
uh, research agenda for, for the center, for the Berkeley Wireless Research Center, and we're looking out maybe 15 or 20 years. So we discussed this issue of what happens next, and we came up with this concept of the on-pad. And what the on-pad is, is, as Jan mentioned, is it's the idea that the pad actually goes away, but its functionality, plus possibly more, remains. So you have unpackaged communication, computation, and storage. And the, the way you do this is if you have a very richly instrumented uh, environment, and you're constantly uh, interacting with the environment, and you don't necessarily have to carry a device around with you. Um, so and sensors and actuators that are in the environment kind of cluster and be, get commissioned for a particular task at hand to interact with an with a individual. So that's, that's the on-pad idea. And of course, whenever we talk about this idea, people ask the question, well, can you really do this? Is there going to be enough sensors and actuators around in the environment to make this possible that you actually can give up carrying a device? And we think so. Uh, obviously, there, you've seen devices like this. There's companies now that are making uh, little projectors that go in glasses. There's Bluetooth-type audio devices for microphone and speakers that you can wear. Uh, there's this a very interesting project up at University of Washington where they're working on contact lenses that are active instead of passive. Right now, they're using it for glucose sensing, but they're also working on the ability to project images directly uh, onto the retina. So I think as far as visual and audio input and output, that's, that's going to be possible. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of other interesting projects going on. This is uh, one about e ECG, but the kind of general idea is that we, we could wear all sorts of sensors uh, in our clothes or have them embedded within our body. Uh, this is an interesting project at Microsoft Research and CMU. We're using a Pico display and uh, a sensing cuff on the arm. Uh, they can make virtual buttons on the arm, so your, your arms become kind of input devices as needed. Uh, this is another one with a kind of a electronic fabric where by pinching you can uh, act, uh, send uh, input. Uh, so there's a project we're working on here which is kind of motivated by this need to very richly uh, instrument the environment. We call it electronic wallpaper. And the idea is that we build kind of um, what looks like conventional wallpaper. You can go to Home Depot and buy this eventually, we hope. You can install it in an existing building or build it into the uh, into residential situations or building situations right uh, during new construction. And what it is is a mesh of something like 10,000 or 20,000 nodes. Each node has a small ASIC, which has processor and storage, along with uh, uh, kind of analog circuitry for uh, RF uh, uh, connection to RF trans, uh, transceivers for connection to antennas. So this is an array of processing elements, storage, antennas, uh, all in kind of a, a flexible fabric. And uh, the, what we think we can do with this, there's a variety of applications depending on what sensors we embed, but you can think of this as a big uh, imager for something like radar type imaging so that the, the wall can have, and the, the computing fabric can have complete awareness of all the occupants in a room and their movements. Uh, you can also use it for narrow beam communication. So we can uh, communicate directly with a device that's on your body or in your pocket without interfering with other devices. <laughs> uh, and then uh, another interesting application would be uh, power delivery. So for instance, those device, embedded devices in your body that have batteries that don't run for very long, you could recharge the batteries by narrow beaming power directly to where it's needed uh, within a person. Right. So in its sensors, its, its actuators, its communication, its storage, all in a nice, easy to install uh, piece of uh, fabric. So obviously, there's lots of challenges associated, associated with building this having to do with manufacturing and uh, system level and uh, you know, getting the power down and distributing the power within the system. And that's kind of a, a project we're working on now. So uh, given this 
this kind of richly uh, instrumented environment. Of course, there's a, a ton of applications and scenarios you could think about. Uh, this is just one that kind of strikes me. If you think about it, uh, so our studies show that watching video and TV is the most common pre-sleep activity. Uh, also, as we know, video delivery is a major consumer of, uh, of energy in the internet. So there's something wrong with this picture, of course. Most of these videos are being distributed to people that are sleeping because that's what they do before they go to sleep. Well, it's easy enough, actually, if the environment uh, has awareness of the occupants, uh, it can figure out that they're sleeping. And, <laughs> of course, uh, shut off the video. <laughs> How much time? Five minutes. Okay. Uh, so, of course, the, the, there's limit, limited, uh, limit, limitless, and unpredictable possibilities for this, for this on-pad idea. Of course, in healthcare, uh, family and social life, education, entertainment, commerce, business, public safety, military. Uh, and this is kind of what Jan said. Absent a grand plan, there's a danger of stovepiping. In fact, we've seen some of these ideas emerging, but they kind of emerge in a domain-specific way. Uh, these are ad hoc solutions specific to a particular domain. Uh, what we really want to do is have an infrastructure or a platform, a uh, set of services that are available to any domain. And there really is an economy of scale here. Once sensors and actuators are everywhere, developers will rely on them, and they'll become the standard way of developing functionality. Now, there's a ton of challenges in this from the wireless and device level and sensor level. But I think one of the kind of most challenging and interesting ones are more, as John said, it closer to think of as the operating system. How, is, how are all these uh, devices controlled? Um, how do we control and allocate the resources? And the resources here are the spectrum, the wireless spectrum, uh, and the use of space for communication, uh, energy, uh, the distribution account computation uh, storage, and the commissioning and the sensors and actuators. And then how do we permit the necessary economy of scales? How do we develop applications in a way that uh, they're portable and we can share functionality? Once something is developed for one application, it can be reused in, in a different application. And then thirdly, uh, there's a question about how do we develop applications for this? What is the model for uh, people to write code and to distribute their applications and make it available to others? So these are uh, questions. Oh, that's funny. Uh, that really require kind of a holistic uh, system level approach and have to borrow ideas from all over. If you think about in the history of computer system, uh, there's always been a few key abstractions that have enabled the, the uh, success. And if you think, think of the Unix operating system, I think kind of the key abstractions were the idea of a file device abstraction, the, the idea that Unix abstracts every physical device as a file and it's a uniform kind of API, uniform way of looking at physical devices. And this was done long before we predicted what all the uh, possible devices would be, and it's an abstraction that has survived and made developing applications simple. Because you could deal everything with everything as a file. Once you, you could change devices by swapping in uh, uh, devices without changing the software. So I think we need similar type of abstractions here in this unpad world in order to enable application development. One kind of idea along these lines is this idea of a service model. And just to give you a little example, the idea is that sensors and actuators uh, that are associated, uh, they're so, they have some associated computation and storage, and they advertise availability, availability of some service. For instance, you could have temperature sensors at some location in the environment. And what they do is, they, and maybe there's humidity sensors and barometric pressure sensors, and they exist and they can provide a service, and then <clears throat> maybe even video input, other computing agents and wrap up these subservices and advertise some enhanced service. For instance, some service provider has the ability to provide the current weather, okay? and then my personal agent that's kind of following me around the environment and moving from uh, computing device to computing device as I move, it then offers a service to me, which is a recommendation service. I, or I can say, should I run in Tilden Park today, or should I go to the gym? And it can answer that question based on the, the local weather, which it gets. Okay. And then, of course, there, opportunistically, there may be other service 
services provided like uh, weather prediction, which uses the barometric pressure along with the local weather. And then perhaps there's state in the system and uh, there could be weather logging that resolves, res resides somewhere and it becomes available. So this, this idea of a, a service model, I think, is one of these simple abstractions. And it also could become not just providing this type of service, but it can become the underlying mechanism for commissioning of spectrum, of uh, computation, storage, and, and routing. OK, and that's it. And I, wow, 23 seconds, I swear. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Time for a question. Mark. Okay. okay, I guess we'll use the time to stay. Question, or you want to? Oh, okay. <laughs> Our next presentation is going to be along the same lines and actually the leading to some of the... Uh, Ruchin has done a lot of work already in using swarms for observing people in a certain space, and she's going to talk about her work in that area and how it relates to the swarm lab in general. Ruchin. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, I guess I, I have to speak fast because I have these slides. So our goal of my group is we are interested in systematic observations <coughs> of people, activities, and their interaction. Uh, the observations are acquired via cameras, motion capture, GPS, various body sensors. So very much in the spirit of the swarms uh, uh, project. The observed data is synchronized, analyzed, feature extracted, and used for modeling of the human performance. So unlike Jan, who explained to you all these futuristic sensors, I am much more um, using uh, commercially available sensors. We built this, this um, laboratory, which has a bunch of cameras and microphones and stereo cameras and, and also wireless <coughs> accelerometers. So here is a depiction of a of a person that is equipped with those little dots on the body are the, the, the um, for motion capture. You can see those four cameras in the line and, and other sensors. So <clears throat> the motion capture system consists of the face space, which is commercially available motion camera, which has 10 cameras. This is, these are the, the numbers. And, the, and we use the motion capture as a ground truth for motion dynamics and stereo reconstruction. Uh, I don't know if you saw this, um, uh, whether this really shows now the, the, the video. Anyway, <clears throat> so from uh, all these cameras, we have, in addition to the motion capture, we have uh, point gray uh, cameras, 12 dragonfly cameras, and um, four camera clusters, uh, two, two cameras for stereo, and four cameras for stereo for better spatial resolution, multi-baseline camera setup. Now, I'm not sure whether this, this really should show. Uh, ah, okay, now you can see, hopefully, what, what it is. So the challenges here are... Okay, the, the body sensors, well, I guess we have, uh, we have um, accelerometers from, from Intel, Shimmer Research, six wireless sensors, and they are in addition to, to, in order to get the acceleration so that we can model the dynamics. Um, you can see here the, 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 the depiction of the dynamics again. Okay, let me go back again. Um, here. Okay, you can see. So one of the challenges, as I will show in, the, in the, this slide, is synchronization. And as uh, the previous speakers 
So one of the, the issues here is that we had to build it from scratch, and every laboratory has to build it from scratch. So the SWARM's agenda to unify, to standardize, to make it so that we can all work on more the abstraction level is extremely highly desirable because this is really time consuming. The time on all computers is synchronized through NTP server. You see, each of these sensors have its own clock, has its own digital sampling difference. So synchronization between different sensors, uh, Dragonfly, Kinect, accelerometers, microphones, they all have their own clocks and, and, and different sampling. So <clears throat> one of the big issues in this business is calibration. I used to give talk calibration, 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 because in order to really bring these all sensors into a world coordinate system, into a unified coordinate system, you really need to calibrate. And that, again, is very painful, and it would be useful um, to really share this kind of, this kind of um, uh, software. So, so we, have, uh, design, we have used this laboratory to image 12 different uh, activities in order to study the dynamics of humans. And here is, you can see that, and you can see how they are synchronized with accelerometers. And so we are now using this for now. <clears throat> the other thing is we have to worry about, as Shankar talked about, privacy. So if you are taking these uh, two people in different locations and you can bring them into a common virtual immersed environment. One of the issues is privacy and the question is how to encode for privacy purposes this information. So here is shown that you can show the complete three-dimensional surfaces but you also can only transmit the skeleton or, par or partial information and so the question from privacy and from application point of view is what do you really want to share, what kind of information you want to share. Okay, so given that we have, um, given that we have all this information, now we can model the dynamics. And um, this is work of Ram Vasadavan who, who has studied the walking and has designed a, dyna a hybrid dynamical system that <clears throat> has, a, has, a, has a very consistent and, and permanent way of describing walking by four different di dynamical systems. One is the, and it's very beautiful because unlike in vision where segmentation is still an open problem, in this physical measurement system, you can detect where you are changing states. So once your acceleration goes to zero, you know you have to switch to a different state. And here is we can measure the, the contact of the right foot and the left foot, and which really go, gives you a very consistent way of, uh, of switching between these hybrid systems. And um, one of our colleagues in Texas A&M has designed actually a robot which very much mimics the, the, the human walking system based on this work. And this we are hoping that we can use for amputees, for example, if you're or if you are missing only right leg or left leg, then we can design a perfect controller that will match your existing foot so that you can walk very naturally. So this is really the, the and this is the, the universal temporal ordering that we got from this, these observations. So thank you. You, 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 you were worried about that I will be over, you're, you're so. You're doing work perfectly, perfectly. So. We have room for some questions. <coughs> While we're preparing the next presentation, we're going to switch actually computers. So any general question?
same thing. If not, the I'm application, sure. of course, are we are investigating several applications in the healthcare and in remote doctor um, advice and studies. So you know, this has tremendous application in healthcare. And I am hoping hope that you know? Professor Jay Han will have some um, comments on that. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, now, if you have all those sensors around you, what we observe is that what it does is enhance the number of ways you can actually interface the information or basically enhance the user interface. And Bjorn will basically talk about some of the opportunities that the live chart can solve of this immersive environment. Bjorn? Great. Thank you for the introduction. So, let's talk about uh, swarm user interfaces for a minute. Oh, actually, let's think about the user experience pre swarms. This is the user experience of desktop computing. We're kind of tied to our chair, focused staring at this one little window um, into the, the virtual world. But of course, all of this changed right once we moved to mobile devices. No, we're still kind of sitting or standing around focused on one small screen with a very limited um, set of, of interfaces. And that is true in the home setting and out in the world as well. Now you can turn this question around and say, OK, so this is our experience of different computing paradigms. What is the computer's mental model of its user? I would say this is the mental model that desktop computing had of us. There's one finger for clicking. <laughs> There's an eye for looking. And oh, yeah, there's stereo sound, so we have two ears. But of course, all of this changed once we went to mobile computing, right? Now we have two fingers for pinching and zooming. And oh, we're in some location on a map as well. So I think the, the really exciting opportunity here is that sensor swarms can engage us much more richly directly in the physical world. And uh, I just want to give you two examples. There will be plenty other examples from, um, from health and other domains. So I just picked entertainment um, as an application domain. So here's an early um, example. What if we go from one screen to multiple screens, multiple devices, and they all have sensing built in? Uh, this is from our good friend David Merrill, who has a startup company in San Francisco called Siftio. And once you have these multiple screens, you can now write applications over the different screens. Um, but we're very good at managing, manipulating multiple different objects with our hands simultaneously. So you can have games that you play by rearranging the objects, um, for example, word games or math games. And this whole agenda is just getting started. Right now, we're on the order of three, five, six, a dozen devices. What if you had 100, 1,000, 5,000 screens available in your office? Um, a second example, also from gaming, is right now we're in this paradigm where you buy the controller, whether it's the Wiimote or the Kinect. And all of the logic of how to control a game is kind of bound up in the game. Well, if we have enough sensors in the environment, what if we turn it around and and say, the purpose of the game is for you to come up with a controller that will best let you play this game. So we had some uh, initial investigations in that direction. We came up with this sensor clamp um, that you could just clamp onto different objects in the environment and turn those objects into game controllers. So for example, people came up with you know, putting it on helmets putting, uh, or putting it on walls so you could hit the walls to to uh, navigate spaceships and games. So there's a whole large uh, space that, that opens up once more sensing is available. Uh, one point I want to make is in the space of sensing, there's um, one primary axis we care about in human-computer interaction is that of monitoring versus direct control. So we already see lots of commercial applications here where you basically buy a sensor and that through the cloud monitors your weight, your activity, your sleep cycles, and shows you that information. But this is basically offline. Right? 
It just aggregates data and shows you that data so you then change your behavior. On the other hand of the spectrum, we have direct control where you really are part of a sensing loop that runs at 100 hertz or uh, a kilohertz. And this is where some of this physiological computing um, work comes in that John, for example, showed you the touching, the finger sensing uh, uh, touch on your arm, or where also lots of um, work in experimental musical instruments comes in, where you really need a very low latency. Now, research in human-computer interaction really in swarms um, in my uh, opinion, has two sides. The first side is, what are new Swarm user interfaces? And the second side is, well, what are the tools you need to build to enable people to build these kinds of Swarm interfaces? So, Swarm UI design tools. Um, I'll give you three quick examples. One is, if you have a sensor Swarm deployed in the building, such as Die Hall right here, how are you going to find out whether all those sensors are working and what they are reporting. You probably don't want to walk around with your laptop and then sit on the ground and say, let me quickly see what's going on in this room. So we need mobile interfaces that allow you to visualize and reprogram sensors deployed in the environment. Um, a second challenge we're running into is that writing inter -applicate interactive applications that now take in streams from multiple different sensors um, currently face a challenge. And that is that all of our traditional frameworks that we've come up with for building user interfaces are built on the assumption that there's one thing happening at a time, one mouse event traveling to one button in the UI. Now, that's no longer true in a world we ha where we have lots of sensors reporting lots of data simultaneously. If you take the situation and apply it to the current set of UI frameworks, you end up with this horrible callback soup where your code is just spread over lots of different places in the application. Now, our approach is um, to find a higher level of abstraction, to define a declarative specification of what interactions that rely on sensing data uh, should be, and then automatically generate recognizers for these interactions and also give you static analysis so you can tell, hey, this one interaction you defined conflicts with this other interaction someone defined ahead of you. So let me give you a quick example of how this works for multi-touch. Most of us probably have multi-touch sensors in our pockets. This is simultaneous interactions version 1.0. Right? You already have two fingers or three fingers that can do things simultaneously. And you can extend that then to the larger set of uh, sensor swarms. So what we're currently working on is um, a system called interaction tablature. So let's say you want to create an interaction that lets you pan and zoom through a 3D scene with this gesture. Instead of writing maybe 15 different callbacks, um, we've developed a, a graphical system where designers author interaction tablature. Now this is um, inspired by guitar tablature. So these are different tracks. Oh, and I guess I'm giving a talk right now. Um, where one of these tracks is one finger. And then we um, just say, at some parts of this, of this tablature, just call one of my functions. So these can be easily graphically authored in a few minutes. And we can then um, take that and transform it into a complicated looking but easy to execute regular expression that we just run over all the sensor data that comes in in real time. Now, a, uh, another point I'd like to make is that who are the designers who will create the next generation of Swarm applications? Well, the first set is you know, in this room, in this building, in Corey Hall and in Soda Hall. But there are only so many EECS PhDs uh, out there. So really, if we want to get widespread adoption, we have to open our design tools to interaction designers and hobbyists. So people who come from different dis disciplinary backgrounds. And we've had a tremendous success with uh, the right kind of design tools, for example, for web development. Almost anyone can now make a nice interactive web page. 
Whether it's well designed or not is a different question, but the tools are there that have opened this space to a, a very large audience. So uh, my contention is that if we really want swarms to succeed, we also have to push the authoring tools um, to a much larger set of users. One specific user group that uh, I've been working with are amateurs and hobbyists. So who in the room has been to Maker Faire before? Okay, uh, about a third of the room. So this is an annual DIY festival in the Bay Area. It's now gone uh, national and global. Last year in San Mateo, there were 80,000 people. One of the primary tools these people like to use are these small microcontrollers called the Arduino. This is a $30 piece of open source hardware. There are now more than 300,000 of these microcontrollers in circulation. Now, that may not sound like a big market, right? You want to sell millions of phones or chips, but there are now 300,000 hobbyists who come up with new sensor applications all over the place. That strikes me a, a much larger number than the number of ex-PhD students. So what could tools look like for these types of audiences? Um, well, we can look at um, how technology is trickling down already. We have additive manufacturing and printed electronics um, advancing very rapidly. These are still the, this is the expensive version of this vision. But we now have sub thousand dollars 3D printers as well. And you can manufacture circuits on $150 vinyl cutters by just feeding copper tape instead of vinyl into these cutters. And so one project uh, we're now working on is to give people digital modeling tools where, for example, they can take in a 3D model of, let's say, a mouse they would like to build and just paint on what areas they would like to uh, have, they would like to be touch sensitive. And we then take this specification and generate the geometry for the 3D printer, circuit layout for our vinyl cutter, and assembly instructions once you get the different parts of how to put it all together. Once you have these parts, how do you define the interactivity? One area we're working on is an approach called programming by demonstration, where you demonstrate the action you would like to recognize. We then run signal processing behind the scenes and extract classifiers. So for example, you can just take your accelerometer, shake it, and say, ah, channel one found an interesting event. Let me just mark that up in a rich graphical user interface, and now I've defined a shake sensor without having to write the whole algorithm from scratch. So the summary here is um, if you take a human-computer interaction perspective on sensor swarms, there are really two areas of research. One is the user interfaces themselves that are built using sensor swarms, and the other uh, exciting area of research is what are the design tools that enable developers, designers, hobbyists, high school students to create swarm user interfaces themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn. You guys are amazing. We're actually ahead of time now. So we have room for questions. Any remarks, thoughts? If not, I'm going to declare a break. Uh, we're going to have a 15-minute break. And after that, we're going to go to some uh, applications, some uh, application areas. And then the last session, the third session of the morning, is going to be devoted to some of the platform components. So that's kind of the schedule for the rest of the morning. So we'll see you back at uh, 10.15. Thank you.